Hello, everyone. This is Kristen Huber, and on behalf of Banyan Security and 451 Research, I would like to welcome you and say thanks for attending today's webcast titled, How to Achieve Zero Trust Security by Leveraging Your Existing Security Investments. Leading off today's discussion will be Garrett Becker, who is Principal Analyst at 451 Research. Joining Garrett will be Tarun Desikin, who is Co-Founder and Chief Operating Officer at Banyan Security. And closing out the discussion today will be special guest Sadiq Khan, who is Chief Information Security Officer at Blue Voyant. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen and we'll get to as many as we can. The presentation slides are available for download in the resources section on your screen. And finally, please check back for the on-demand version of this webinar after the conclusion of the live event. And with that, I'll turn it over to Garrett. Thanks, Kristen, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us. So, um, yeah, so just before we get started, a few words about me. I've been at 451 for four, uh, five and a half years, and one of uh, roughly six analysts on our security team currently, and my two primary coverage areas are identity and access management and data security. Um, and those two controls are pretty popular in newer areas like cloud and IoT security. Uh, so I get pulled into those quite a bit. And in the past year or so, I've spent a lot of time uh, researching the uh, what's known as zero trust phenomenon and the different vendors within zero trust and, and really uh, you know, taking a deep dive on zero trust, which uh, is gonna be the focus of our conversation today. So uh, very briefly, for those of you who may not be aware of us, um, we were founded in 2000. Uh, we've got about 250 employees, 125 analysts like myself, scattered all over the globe. Um, one of the things we do, I'd say it's maybe different than other firms, we write a lot of individual reports on individual vendors. And just for reference, there are now about 3,000, I've heard as many as 3,500 security vendors alone, um, which compares to about 800 when I started five years ago. So it's quite a lot to cover. Um, I also get asked pretty often, where does the name 451 come from? So any of you science fiction fans that may have guessed Ray Bradbury, Ray, uh, excuse me, Ray Bradbury and the, the science fiction novel Fahrenheit 451, you would be correct. So agenda today, a um, few key points I really want to wrap the discussion around. Uh, one is really a focus on zero trust and specifically on, on the evolution of zero trust and how we've gotten to this point after 10 years. Um, I also think before we, we, we do that, I think we need to spend some time on definitions and some basic terms. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the old perimeter model and why that's no longer working. And uh, we'll look at some of the different terminology out there that's been sort of conflated with zero trust. And then we'll uh, we'll have some high level takeaways before I turn it over to uh, Tarun and Sadiq. So this is sort of uh, becoming almost a cliche in security these days to talk about the, the perimeter being dead, um, but it's certainly not a very controversial statement, but I, I think it's a good place to start out. Um, this is a scene from Monty Python and Holy Grail, if anybody remembers that movie and the basic idea is um, Security has historically been about building walls, right? We, we put a perimeter or a boundary uh, around our networks, and we assume that anything on the inside is trusted and anyone on the outside is untrusted. And then that serves as the basis for determining what resources and applications we can access. Um, now, this idea is, is very slowly being eroded. I wouldn't say it's completely dead, um, but a number of things are going on. Obviously, there have been a lot of insider breaches in the past few years. Edward Snowden is a, a prominent one, but a lot of others. Um, so you can make the point that network security is, is a lot less effective than it used to be. And nowadays there's a lot of phishing and social engineering going on that allows people to get in fairly easily. Um, but I think maybe even the bigger issue is that I would argue the perimeter is becoming less and less relevant. You take a very extreme example, you know, thanks to things like cloud and mobile and IoT and uh, users as well. Um, you know, you may have users who may or may not be employees, right? They could be contractors or partners. They may be temporary workers. They may or may not be in your corporate directory or your HR system. Uh, they may be in the office or outside of the office. They could be in a Starbucks. They could be accessing applications that are SaaS apps 
from an unmanaged device. And the point is that uh, at no time will any of this tr cross the traditional corporate network. So it's really hard to apply policy to what your users can and can't do in those types of situations. Um, now, the last point I want to make, and this is an interesting one, is we still seem to spend the most of our money on, on network security. In fact, we do a fair amount of survey work at 451, and we consistently find that network security still has the highest spending plans and the highest budgets of all security um, technology. So that's something that needs to change, in my opinion. So next slide. What is zero trust? And I think we need, it's pretty clear we need to move beyond the perimeter approach. Again, I don't think it'll be completely go away, but I, I think it, it, it's safe to say that it's not enough. And we've heard a lot of attention in the past year or so specifically around this concept of zero trust. But um, it's really been around for, for quite some time, certainly to the early 2000s. I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, but I just came back from the Black Hat Conference a few weeks ago. In fact, Tarun and I ran into each other there. Um, and I think the one takeaway is, two takeaways, is there's a lot of interest in the concept of zero trust. But even more importantly, there's a lot of confusion about exactly what it means. Uh, people are a little bit unclear. There are different definitions floating around that we're going to talk about uh, very soon. Um, to me, the zero trust means a few things. One, um, we're doing away with the old perimeter-based model where everything on the inside is, is trusted and everything on the outside is untrusted. Um, we're getting to a point where access should really be more on who you are and not where you are. So, um, you know, again, where you are may matter, but it's not the primary thing that determines what you can access. Um, another concept I like to think about is about the, the principle of least privilege and the idea is that you only grant users access to those things that they, they specifically need to do their jobs and nothing more. Um, and up till now, we, we've, except for certain pockets, we've pretty much taken the opposite approach where we basically let everything in by default and then you try to filter out the bad stuff. But obviously we're, we're learning very quickly and painfully that that's no longer working. So the point of this slide is, is really go over some of the different terminology out there. And again, um, you know, I've come to the view that zero trust is really not about a specific technology. Um, it's not like you know, if you're in the SIM space and, and that's about a specific way of, of, of doing things or even an endpoint, they're very specific technologies. To me, Zero Trust is really a collection of different technologies that really help us achieve um, a, a really a, a framework or a way of thinking about security or a philosophy of security as it is about a specific technology. And here are some of the different names that you may hear floating around that um, are not specifically 100% similar, but they're very similar, uh, somewhat adjacent. So Beyond Corp is one that that's a, the name that was put forward by Google has become pretty popular. Um, conditional access is used by by Microsoft. Um, we've got an identity where a proxy that's also used by Google. So um, lots of different names floating around. So, but for our purposes, we'll we'll stick to zero trust for this talk. So, um, point of this slide is. In, a, in addition to different names, there are a lot of different pieces to the zero trust puzzle. And it really depends to a large degree on how you define it. Um, one of the challenges I ran into when I wrote my report earlier this year is if you define it very narrowly, um, you've got probably 25 or so, certainly less than 50 vendors that could arguably be called zero trust. Um, now there's a lot more, there's a other terminology floating around these days that tends to broaden um, the definition, the problem you run into there is that just about any security vendor could make some sort of a claim to being a zero trust vendor. But again, to simplify things, I think um, really three key things for me that really are the essence of zero trust. One is, again, it's who are you? Um, what you can access is more determined, depend on who you are. And it's important to note that this is not just for humans, right? It can be users and employees, but increasingly it's non-human factors. We're talking about applications, we're talking about devices, we're talking about services as we get into a microservices framework, which Tarun may talk about. Um, and this implies a strong role for authentication technologies, whether it be multi-factor authentication. Um, on the device side, you can do things like 
IP addresses or, or MAC addresses, um, device fingerprinting, certificates, etc. Um, getting a little background noise there, so maybe somebody could go on mute. Um, second piece, um, once you've figured out who you are, you need to determine what you're allowed to access, and this is a, applies a role for policies. So you need some sort of rules uh, to determine, okay, what can you access once you've been authenticated? And this points to a role maybe for single sign-on or directory services, certainly in user groups, or maybe a privilege access management service. And then the last big piece we really need is a way to basically enforce those rules. Okay, we figured out who you are, we figured out what you should be allowed to access, then we need to enforce that. So that's either, you know, allowing access, blocking access, um, maybe stepping up and requiring a stronger form of authentication. Um, and it also implies a role for segmentation and micro-segmentation that we'll talk about a bit in the next few slides. So um, in my view, they're really getting into the heart of things. There are really five things that are really important, um, uh, five phases if you look at the evolution of zero trust. And this is um, a little bit messy, not always clear, um, hard and fast. There are some of these vendors that arguably could be belong to multiple categories, but for the most part, I think they, they hold pretty well. But I'd say the first part to start out is with segmentation. And as I mentioned earlier, zero trust is a concept that really goes back to the early 2000s. Um, there were a bunch of security practitioners that got together in a thing called the Jericho Forum, where they tried to deal with the potential impact of cloud computing and deparameterization. Um, so that's where a lot of the conceptual roots started. The actual term zero trust was probably put forth around 10 years ago. So it's been around longer than perhaps some people may realize, although it's, it's starting to really become popular now. Um, the basic idea of segmentation, and this actually goes back to the early 1980s when VLANs were first technically developed. Um, they really became popular in the early 2000s when the firewall vendors started uh, really pushing VLANs. But the basic idea is, you know, in the old perimeter model, you had a flat network. So once you're granted access, you can pretty much go wherever you want. Um, now that we've learned in the past few years that's problematic. Uh, people can move laterally to go after different targets once they get in. So one of the advantages of VLANs, you could set up, you could virtually segment your network. So maybe you set up a VLAN for a different departments like HR or finance or for your developers, and that will uh, somewhat limit the amount of things you can access. Now, a newer phenomenon is micro-segmentation. There are some vendors that, that address that, and it, it basically takes this concept to the extreme where you can have network, virtual network segments reduced down into specific uh, servers or even actual individual workloads. Um, and one of the drivers for this was when we started having changes in the organization and we had a lot more non-employees accessing our networks, you know, contractors and suppliers and partners. This is one way to limit um, what they could access and not just give them free reign to our entire network. Um, second big phase is pretty much known as software defined perimeter or SDP. And in my view, what SDP does, it effectively shrinks the perimeter down to a single application. So instead of being an app to access the entire network or segment, you get access to specific applications. And the way the SDP vendors initially did this was through some form of uh, a combination of on-prem, excuse me, client software, a controller, or maybe a gateway device um, that could be used as an alternative to a VPN. So if you had remote workers who needed access to a specific app, you could give it to them with an SDP without needing to spend the money on a, on a VPN and you know, setting up the client software and what have you. Um, and most of that, um, again, it was a lot of on-prem hardware and software that typically consisted of proxies and whatnot that would typically sit on your internal network in front of your applications, your directories, your servers, what have you. Um, the next, won't spend too much time on this one, but a lot of the identity-based vendors like Duo, uh, or Okta, as a typo there, sorry, it should be Duo, uh, or even Microsoft are basically leveraging their authentication, multi-factor authentication, uh, single sign-on capabilities to deliver a zero trust experience. Um, next one I think is very getting very popular right now, but 
the CDN players, vendors like Akamai or Cloudflare, um, are, have gotten into space, which is a logical move, uh, given they have very highly distributed networks, so it's fairly straightforward to use their cloud-based architecture to allow employees and partners to access internal applications. And we call them the man in the middle cloud because essentially they, they almost function like a cloud-based proxy um, to access your applications you go through their cloud and then you apply policy and then if everything passes, they will then forward you down to the target applications. Um, again, this is a, a, an alternative to a VPN and the difference with the, the initial SDPs is that you, you typically don't need a lot of on-prem hardware, much of it just sits up in the cloud. Lastly, uh, what we've come to call the cloud integrated uh, zero trust providers and I would, I would put Banyan in this category, I would say the essential difference from the prior group is that the cloud integrated zero trust providers basically can leverage your existing cloud infra infrastructure. Um, you know, years ago, many folks didn't have any cloud resources. Nowadays, most, almost every enterprise has some degree of cloud infrastructure. Um, they've invested in AWS and Google Cloud and Azure or likely all three of them. They've got SaaS apps, they've got virtual private clouds, et cetera. <clears throat> so the cloud integrated approach allows you to achieve zero trust remote access um, by leveraging those, those investments you've already made in cloud rather than going through a proprietary cloud from a, from a CDN provider. So uh, getting near the home stretch on my section, um, some of the benefits of zero trust, obviously, um, there better be some benefits because otherwise there'd be no reason going through the effort. But I'd say obviously one of the main benefits of, of doing zero trust is to greatly reduce or uh, if not eliminate your reliance on VPNs for remote access. Um, and that's something I think Tarun will talk about in a little more detail. Um, Google, great example. Google came up with their Beyond Corp model a couple of years ago. One of the things they wanted to do is try to get, a, get rid of phishing attacks. And one of their stated goals is to have every Google employee work from an untrusted network. So uh, any network anywhere, trusted or not, just do away with this notion of trust and do so without using VPN. Now, um, another key benefit, reduced attack, attack service. One of, the, one of the advantages of doing a zero trust architecture or an SDP um, is that you can access applications without exposing them to the public internet. So if the bad guys can't probe or, or, or basically can't see your applications, uh, then they can't attack it. It certainly makes it a lot harder. Um, potentially lower cost. There may be some initial upfront cost, but at least the theory is that over time, um, you can reduce some of your costs by getting rid of your dedicated hardware or what have you. <coughs> um, now, it won't necessarily be easy. Um, cost is one of the potential benefits. It's also potentially a drawback, at least up front. And one great example is Google, mighty Google, um, with all their financial and technical resources, uh, took them three years to design their Beyond Court model. So I, I think uh, for a lot of firms, this is, is really unrealistic. So we really need to think about ways we can achieve some of the benefits of zero trust without, uh, with leveraging what you have and without necessarily ripping apart your entire infrastructure. Um, and this is a, 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 an issue we hear over and over from enterprises. Um, had a lot of conversations about this a couple weeks ago at Black Hat and at RSA, um, you know, particularly in areas like financial services and healthcare and oil and gas, where there's uh, potentially millions, if hundreds of millions of dollars invested in legacy uh, equipment that's not going away anytime soon. Um, complexity is another big issue. Um, there can be many pieces to a zero trust architecture as we discussed earlier. So making sure they all work together uh, is, is not always trivial. And there's certainly no, no vendors out there that I'm aware of that sell the entire zero trust framework uh, in a single solution or in a box. It just doesn't exist. Um, and when you get into really you know, microservices and you know, you've got instances spun up and down uh, very rapidly and you're doing micro segmentation, things can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. So, Certainly there's a role for autom automation to be played here. Um, and the last one, perhaps the most importantly, user experience. Um, uh, user experience is one of the main reasons we're doing this, but if you don't get it right, um, you know, the first time you have an executive who can't access a sensitive application, there's certainly going to be some blowback and some complaints. So 
certain we need to uh, minimize disruption and, and what have you. Um, so really the point of this is, you know, we don't really need to achieve this all overnight and think of it really as a journey. I know that sounds like a cliche in security, but um, certainly there can be some quick wins um, early off without, again, ripping everything apart. Um, one of the things you might be able to do is, you know, identify one or two really risky applications or very uh, sensitive applications that have a big impact on worker productivity. Start out there, uh, enable zero trust, and maybe, you know, apps like a Jira or a Confluence, um, you know, enable access to them without a VPN. That could certainly be a, a good way to start. Or you can do a similar thing where you pick out one or two very risky applications. Uh, you keep your VPN, but you supplement it with, with SDP or zero trust to make it um, help you reduce the risk and make it more secure as, I guess, almost a defense in depth type of approach. Um, certainly just enabling more MFA would be a big win for a lot of firms. Um, our data shows just over 50% of enterprises actually use multi-factor authentication. <clears throat> so just deploying MFA more broadly, I, in my opinion, would actually be a, a, a win here. But again, the point is let's think about zero trust as a, as a journey and an ongoing process rather than a big bang quick fix. Um, so that's basically it for my section. Uh, a few key points to leave you with. Um, you know, we're very early in the days of zero trust, so there's going to be a lot of new developments in the next few years, but I do think, despite all the hype, this could be one of the biggest developments to hit security in years, certainly in the way we think about security. Um, we're probably going to see a lot of M&A. We've seen some already with some of the bigger vendors like Cisco and Verizon getting involved, and I think that's certainly going to continue. Um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tarun and Sadiq, who... Uh, talk about their perspectives on zero trust. Thank you very much, Garrett. <clears throat> Appreciate the intro. Um, my name is Tarun Desikin, and I'm a co-founder of a company called Banyan. Uh, I've spent about 20 years in the network and security space, so some of the evolution that Garrett talked about uh, really resonated with me, pretty much you know, all the different phases, and it's really uh, exciting for me to talk to you guys about how Banyan sees the zero trust problem and how we help companies deliver zero trust access to their sensitive resources. Um, just a little bit more about Banyan. Uh, we are what Garrett describes as a cloud integrated zero trust platform. So we have been built from the ground up for today's modern multi-cloud and hybrid environments. Um, we are deployed across enterprises today, across all verticals from finance to healthcare, as well as technology. And companies use us primarily to either replace their VPNs or create a new security model, a new zero trust model for themselves, their own flavor of zero trust, leveraging their investments. Um, as Garrett described, you know, zero trust is a, is a framework. It's not just a, a single silver bullet. And so, Many organizations need to figure out exactly what specific tooling, what specific investments they have, and how they can use those investments to roll out zero trust for their employees and their applications. And that's where Banyan comes in. So when we look at why zero trust evolves, it, it actually comes down to how a traditional VPN was deployed. Now, I was a VPN guy myself, and so you know, VPN was a great technology, but it has essentially been unchanged for about 20 years. And it was created for an environment where you had a trusted corporate network where office workers access corporate applications. When you needed the office worker to go home and still have access to those applications or for remote workers, you created a VPN. So the remote worker would essentially tunnel in to the corporate network and then access the applications they needed to do their job. Um, once we started having contractors, we introduced the concept of segmentation. So certain applications could be accessed by employees, others by contractors, and so on. Now, if you look at the world today, it's not that simple anymore. Uh, a lot of infrastructure has migrated to the cloud. You know, it could be on Azure or GCP. So people have started extending their VPNs in there. Some companies have also started doing cloud-native development using Docker and Kubernetes, and you start extending your VPNs in there. And finally, a lot of your applications are actually not running on infrastructure you control anymore. They might be running on SaaS platforms like Salesforce and Workday. 
So that's on the infrastructure and the application side. What we see on the user and the devices side is that bring your own device is a real thing. You know, pretty much every employee, every company has to deal with executives and workers who want to work from their iPhones and their iPads. And then the pool of employees and workers who need access has also changed. So suddenly what was a fairly simple remote access problem that was dealt with with a VPN and a trusted network, you know, it just becomes very, very challenging and problematic. So security concerns around broad access, you know, a contractor here can just get access to a sensitive application in the cloud, down to something like how complicated it is to deploy all these physical and virtual appliances that were designed for a simpler time have become really, really challenging. So when we at Banyan think about zero trust, we think of zero trust as a model to address the deficiencies in this trusted network model. Um, and as Garrett described, Google's Beyond Corp is probably one of the best articulated solutions where what they essentially did was create an access control engine by looking and aggregating user inventory, device inventory, policies, all the different applications into a centralized framework. Of course, as Gary described, it took them three years to do this. And what we have realized is many organizations want this level of security, but they also do not have the resources to essentially build something like this from scratch. And so that's where Banyan comes in. Banyan helps organizations leverage their existing security tooling to roll out zero trust. So specifically the way we do it is we no longer rely on the concept of a trusted network. Instead, we have a cloud integrated solution where we provide what we call our intelligent access mesh that manages traffic into all your applications. The access mesh is deployed close to your applications. It doesn't matter where they run. Could be on premise, could be in the cloud, could be SaaS. Um, and then when it comes to the entities that require access, we integrate with your identity providers, uh, ensure all access, it comes through single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and from a device that is both trusted and registered. And we combine all of this into a concept we call a trust code. So this is not just are you authenticated, it uses your context to figure out how trusted are you. You know, we know your location, we know exactly what kind of application you're trying to access and what kind of device you're trying to do that from. And that determines a number from zero to 100 on how granular your controls need to be. And finally, we provide a cloud command center that ties all this together. So we tie together the entities that need access as well as the applications that you're looking to get access into. And so from the user perspective, it is just a single button direct access into that application that they're seeking to hit. Um, so security teams like Banyan because the cloud command center gives them ability to write granular policies and in real time enforce the activity that's going on. This is something you did not get with the VPN, which was a very static way of de delivering access. The trust scoring, again, uses user context and uses short-lived credentials, uses cryptography. So some of the modern security principles are used to mediate access into applications. The operations teams are really value how quick it is to set up Banyan. Typical installation is about 10 to 15 minutes, leverages your existing cloud presence, so no new kind of complex integrations are required. And finally, users, because they get direct access, you know, are given a great user experience. So one of the ways Banyan is able to enable organizations to quickly roll out zero trust is by integrating with their existing tools. So we integrate with tools such as your identity provider. So this could be Okta or Active Directory or one of those other kinds of players. Um, we integrate with your device managers, which could be AirWatch or Jamf and so on. Integrate with entity analytics tools like Splunk. And finally, antivirus and EDR tools like Carbon Black or CrowdStrike. And we use all these integrations to compute a trust score for the entity that requires access. On the deployment side, our access mesh integrates with whichever cloud platform, you know, be it Amazon or Azure or GCP or something on-premise like VMware or Citrix integrates with all of these to manage access into your applications. And the net result is that when a security professional comes to the cloud command center, they can write simple human readable policies in terms of my engineering team, or this is the level of trust that the entity requires to get access. 
So organizations that use Banyan typically end up writing three types of zero trust policies. Um, one is what we call a global rule. This is a high level policy, a high level zero trust policy that applies to all your services, all your resources. It could be something that says, hey, if a device is at a low trust level, you cannot submit source code. So this is a simple policy that an IT administrator can write and will be enforced globally across all your different applications. You can also start getting more and more granular. You can write something on a specific service that says, if you're a finance application, you can only be accessed by members from the finance team. And finally, uh, because of the way Banyan is deployed, you can actually write API level policies. And this is very useful for some development services that have sensitive data that need to be accessed only by very specific team members. So just in summary then, you know, what we have worked on at Banyan is to enable enterprises to provide beyond corp like security integrated with your own tool your own existing enterprise investments without having to build any of them from scratch. And so this both enhances security and user experience. And best of all, you know, we've made it so that it's simple and easy to deploy. So with that, I'll hand over to Sadek, who will talk about kind of a real world scenario where a real world enterprise went through their zero trust journey and how they have been able to configure their environment to roll out zero trust. Thanks for that, Tarun. I appreciate it, and, and thank you all for attending the webinar today. Um, as Tarun mentioned, my name is Sadiq Khan. I'm the CISO here at Blue Voyant um, and come from a consulting background where I spent time both at Deloitte and Booz Allen Hamilton, really work, refining the approach to data security, working with numerous Fortune 500 companies and, and, and helping them architect their security program and, and building an operational approach to uh, defense in depth. So a little bit about Blue Voyant. Our mission here is to really democratize security for the 99% in today's ecosystem, given the challenges and costs around sourcing and building a advanced cyber capability. That privilege is usually selected for just the 1% of organizations that have the ability to build that robust security program. Our goal here is to deliver advanced security capabilities to the masses, allowing organizations to effectively defend against the ever evolving threat landscape. Um, that mission really starts with our managed security services line of business, where we offer a host of services centered around detection and containing attacks before they impact your business. We've built a next-gen orchestration engine that integrates with various technologies in your stack um, and allows us to really extend those cyber, advanced cyber controls to businesses of all sizes. That's further complemented by our threat intelligence line of business where we have unparalleled visibility and we offer that to customers both in forms of identifying threats that directly impact your business, your footprint, your attack service, but also looking at your broader third party ecosystem and helping you identify attacks that are impacting your vendors that may end up impacting you down the line. Um, we also have a professional services line of business that's led by um, a team of ex-FBI cybercrime special agents where we um, have a great deal of experience helping organizations manage and, response and respond to breaches while also providing a, a breadth of professional services. Uh, so a little bit about Blue Voyant and our growth, our growth story. We were established two years ago where we were acquired a couple of entities and our initial seed round was $125 million, which really allowed us to accelerate the development of our new MSS and, and threat intelligence platform, right? And so operationally, what that meant was we rapidly expanded both from a user-based perspective, but also um, from a ge geographical perspective, right? So Bluevoin is now a multinational entity that has employees all over the world and customers all over the world. And, and so what that meant was we had a lot of challenges that I'm sure a lot of organizations can resonate with in terms of, we had a growing user base where roles and responsibilities become a challenge to define, right? Especially in organizations where you have rapid restructuring and reorganization, based on my experience, that happens in organizations both small and large, right? So being able to proactively and dynamically respond to those organizational shifts is a real challenge when trying to architect a zero trust story. Um, and then you add, you know, customers accessing products and services that you're building as well, and that adds an additional layer of access that must that has to be managed and controlled 
and basically adds to the complexity of securing your infrastructure, right? Um, on top of that, we also, given the three lines of businesses, we also had distinct technology stacks that our developers and engineers were operating on, were building for each line of business, right? And, and so when thinking about how to holistically build a security program that encompasses all of those, you then have to start thinking about interoperability and integration challenges that you have when you're really trying to centrally manage all of these things. And so those were some of the challenges that we were thinking about when we sought out to build a security program that not only protected Blue Buoyant, but also made sure we were securing the sensitive information that we collect for all of our customers. And so when thinking about that, you start in any security journey by defining the threat model, right? And so the goal of zero trust from a threat model perspective is, be able, is to be able to defend against all attacks by opportunity opportunistic attackers, right? So script kiddies that are just um, launching attacks and seeing what sticks, but also targeted attacks by adversaries that may be using spear phishing campaigns and also by insiders, right? Where you have a host of trusted and untrusted insiders that are going to be accessing your systems from um, a variety of different locations and a variety of different devices, right? And so the goal of Zero Trust is being able to standardize your approach to brokering access so that attacks from any one of these threat actors can be easily identified and easily remediated. And so to be able to then build controls around that specific threat model, you then have to ask yourself three basic questions. Do you understand your users? Do you have controls of, do you have a control of all assets connecting to your environment? And do you actually have a comprehensive view of your infrastructure? Right. And so when we talk about user and access management in a traditional setting, we heard Garrett and, and Truen both mention the concept of least privilege. Right. But in a pragmatic operational setting, the first month you define your identity management program where you architect your roles and you architect the entitlements that you grant to your roles. It may look great in month one, right, because you took the time to run the analysis and figure out what people actually need to get access to. But over time, privileges add up, right? Users change teams. They may not be fully transitioned. They start wearing multiple hats. And so privilege builds up and you lose more and more of that granular enforcement of least, of least privilege, right? And so really defining these static policies doesn't help in terms of enabling a zero trust approach, right? So it's really about being able to effectively understand your users as they grow over time, as their roles change, and, and really integrate that into a system that's integrated with your HR, with IT, with security, so you have this feedback loop that's continuously refining your understanding of who's accessing your system. Now, the second part of that equation is then understanding what assets are being used to connect your infrastructure, right? So, um, you know, exactly what they are, do you know who's using them, and do you have a centralized inventory of those assets so that you're able to feed that telemetry into your, um, into your authorization decision? And then the third part of that is how am I going to control my environment in an era where we have multi-cloud infrastructures, where we have SaaS applications that we use, where we, have, where we still have on-prem applications that we're deploying and, and, and using, being able to visually define what your inventory looks like so that you're able to architect controls around that is critical for enabling the zero trust approach. Um, and so it's not only about being able to identify what hosts you have in your environment and what servers you're managing, but it's also what's running on those servers, right? Um, do you have an idea of all the applications running? Do you have an idea about the software versions that those applications are running on those instances? Right. And so all of these questions are things that are that were factored into our decision around how we architect a security program and how we leverage all of these different uh, sources of telemetry and, and, and these risk factors and enabling intelligent authorization decisions. Right. Now, that, that sounds great from a conceptual perspective, being able to completely understand your users, identify your devices, know what your infrastructure looks like and being able to seamlessly string those all together. Um, but we know in reality that that's not a magic bullet, if you will, right? There's no one solution that you can purchase off the shelf that's gonna give you all of those things and then also enforce zero trust access controls for you, right? And so 
it's really about establishing core tenants of your security program, right? And, and that's the approach that we took when setting off on this journey two years ago. And these are controls that you'll see in any security program that's built on defense and depth principles, right? So being able to curate threats that impact your business, both from an external perspective, but also an internal perspective, right? So running those vulnerability scans and being able to feed those to your security and operations team so that, you know, you're effectively patching your devices, you're prioritizing which vulnerabilities you should remediate, and, and at the very least, you have a robust understanding of all the vulnerabilities across your environment, right? And then from an identity and access management perspective, we talked about how critical this was in terms of enabling a zero trust approach, right? And, and just to focus on that a little more, um, it's my opinion that this is probably one of the more, most important parts uh, about the zero trust occasion, right? Because as we talked about, being able to define roles and attributes in a dynamic environment is extremely challenging, right? And the approach we've taken is to automate as much of that based on a tight integration with your HR information security system, right? And so when a user is onboarded, when a contractor is onboarded, you absolutely must have a gate there that allows HR to feed certain attributes to the rest of your environment, right? Where is this user going to be located? What team are they on? Who do they report to? What types of functions will they be performing? And you really need to create automatic rule-based attributes that dynamically populate your backend engine so that any change that's made to a user's profile automatically flows down to the rest of your source systems and is then effectively used when making risk-based access decisions. Um, endpoint protection is, you know, the first gate here, if you will, right? When you think about the zero trust occasion, the first zero trust equation, the first thing that gets evaluated is what device is trying to connect to my environment, right? And so being able to layer in defenses at the endpoint from, the, from an endpoint perspective is, is critical here as well, right? Is my, do I have a way to enforce um, all my endpoints are patched? Do I have a way to discover all of the applications running on my endpoint? Do I have a way to broker how privileges are leased for my endpoint, right? You really shouldn't be giving away local admin, for example, so you need some sort of solution that helps you least elevated privileges and allowing you to implement a robust auditing capability for when those privileges are invoked, right? And, and going down the line here, there's several controls that you're going to implement across your security apparatus to give you that defense in depth posture. The challenge really here is how do I integrate all of those and how do I build those into my authorization flow so that we're automatically and intelligently responding to threats as they come up in our environment, right? And so typically organizations that have the funding, that have the resources may embark on doing them themselves, right? You constantly refer back to the buy versus build decision, especially for, you know, your large um, FS institutions, for example, that um, may have, that may be adverse to purchasing, you know, third-party technology. But that's sort of the um, major blocker, in my opinion, in terms of organizations really embarking on this advanced zero trust journey, being able to um, integrate all of these different solutions when brokering access. And so that's sort of the position we were in about a year ago where, you know, we implemented these several layer of defenses. We had, you know, VPN connecting into our private infrastructure in the cloud. Um, we had certain on-prem applications that we were hosting that were also protected by the VPN. But what we really, you know, realized was we weren't effectively building a zero trust environment, right? Because VPN, you authorize once into your network, and that's really it. Sure, you can implement certain things like hit checks and um, mutual TLS with device authentication. But again, once that authentication is performed, you really don't have a way to continuously monitor um, what's happening on the device and whether or not you should be taking action within a existing session, right? And, th and that's one of the focal points of zero trust. And so if you don't have a way to implement that, you're, you're kind of lost in terms of being able to achieve a true zero trust environment. Um, the second big operational complexity to a traditional VPN approach from, from our experience is, again, once you've strayed away from your initial design, it becomes every addition to, the, to a network zone, every change to a user's role and attribute um, is a process, right? You then 
it, it takes a, you know, a village to kind of come together, look at your entire network architecture again, just to make a simple change, right? And so really trying to enforce some of these concepts with um, a traditional VPN-based solution becomes a headache, especially once you start dealing with multiple business lines, multiple zones, multiple cloud environments. Um, it, it really doesn't allow you to, to move at, at an agile pace. Um, as Garrett mentioned, there's also, and, and Turin mentioned, there's also several companies trying to do this, um, and the way they implement their solutions provides some challenges when thinking about how to layer these defenses, right? So you may have a CASB solution that you're using to track down your shadow IT. You may have a VPN solution that you're using right now to provide access to, to your private cloud environment. Um, and then you may try to introduce this you know, third zero trust controller to help broker access to certain things. And it becomes, the more and more you try to layer network, network security access-based solutions, it becomes um, a gigantic architectural mess being able to tie all those together, right? And so that's where, you know, if, if we give any advice, it's really finding the right technology vendor that's going to meet you where you are and allow you to make changes in small waves that then work to really build this true zero trust enterprise. And so that's that's really what we found in Banyan when we started this conversation um, earlier this year. Uh, we presented the challenge that we had to Banyan in terms of we weren't able to continuously evaluate authorization decisions. We had difficulty integrating a lot of these trust signals from the various tools that we've implemented across our environment. And when we were evaluating multiple tools, that was that was really the um, one of the main factors we were looking for in a solution was to being able to seamlessly tie all of these together and make those continuous authorization decisions based on our existing security investment. Banyan was by far the leader in terms of being an extensible technology vendor that allowed you to accomplish all of the goals of implementing a zero trust program while leveraging your existing technology suite, right? And so the approach we took was we weren't going to completely rip and replace our VPN solution. What we were going to do was a model similar to what Google took, was to build this access proxy or this secure zero trust environment in parallel and give users the opportunity to realize the efficiencies and the benefits of using this zero trust environment while giving us the confidence that we were actually evaluating intel evaluating authorization decisions and making intelligent um, response decisions based on telemetry that we were seeing in the environment, right? And so we were able to loop in our directory service where we have that robust automated attribute-based mapping. We were able to loop in all of our device and configuration management information where we have a complete understanding of what OS versions are running on an application, uh, or I'm sorry, what OS is running on a device, uh, what sort of logging services are enabled, um, you know, is, is full disk encryption turned on, those types of factors that we'd want to check for any, you know, secure device, being able to combine those with telemetry that we were getting from tools like CrowdStrike or Carbon Black, process monitoring tools like OS Query, um, and, and some additional enrichment information that we were getting from environments like Splunk, feeding those into Banyan to continuously evaluate uh, authorization decisions is what we were able to accomplish, right? And, and again, from our perspective, uh, Banyan is, is one of the only providers right now that it is truly extensible in a way that allows you to leverage what you already have in place to quickly enable a zero trust environment. And if I had to share any tips in terms of how to effectively go about this approach, it's, it's really defining and then trusting the process, right? And so when you think about zero trust, again, the idea is you wanna enable secure access in this dynamic, ever shifting technology landscape, right? And so the initial, when you present this to a leader or you know, a tech manager and, and tell them, hey, I wanna take GitLab or Jira behind VPN, off of VPN so that you can access it you know, directly, they're gonna think you're crazy and they're gonna think you actually don't know security or you're not actually doing your job, right? But the idea is you wanna invest in building a culture of security, right, where users aren't only an additional source of telemetry, where, where they're reporting phishing campaigns, where they're reporting um, you know, suspicious things that they may observe during their day-to-day -day business, but they also understand the 
the architecture that you're trying to build, right? They, they understand what you're trying to achieve with this zero trust approach, um, and they start buying into the concept. And so, you know, user awareness and training is, is key here, um, but effectively helping them understand the efficiencies they're gaining through the process is also very important. Um, the second part of that is, you know, get Garrett mentioned, you can start with one or two apps that are really sensitive. Um, I would offer, you know, going even smaller than that, right? Focus on one protocol for one application, right? So what we did was um, we mentioned MFA isn't often available for things like SSH or RDP access, right? And so it's figuring out um, some champions that you can identify in your development organization that will really get on board, understand the uh, security benefits that you're getting from achieving things like MFA with SSH or RDP and helping and allowing them to champion how much this enables them to do their job in a secure way, right? And um, as we mentioned, we're rolling this out with VPN in place, and so it's really not a rip and replace. It's enabling access through a more secure method and a more secure channel, and as users gain trust over time, you can then um, focus in on honing the technologies that you're using to broker access. Um, and, and, you know, again, really being able to um, focus on the user experience here is key, right? Being able to put in stringent preventative IT and security controls is always going to be the easy way out. But the more you make it harder for your users to do their job, um, the more they're going to work to evade your controls and your defenses and, and you know, actually end up being uh, a negative for your security program, right? And so working with solutions like Banyan that make Zero trust, easy to roll out, easy for users to adopt, uh, is imperative to a successful zero trust journey. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to Kristen. Great, thank you so much, Sadiq. Um, it's now time for our Q&A session. And as a quick reminder, um, if you have a question, just type it in the box on your screen. And it does look like we have time maybe for one or two quick questions that have come in. Um, first question, um, I think it's going to be geared toward Garrett. So um, here it goes. Our leadership has decided we need to migrate to a cloud-based zero-trust solution. What are the pros and cons of the different approaches? And what are the risk, risks in delivering our sensitive corporate data through the cloud? Sure. Thanks, Kristen. So, um, you know, I, I think, and certainly Tarun and Sadiq can jump in too if they want, but I think, you know, it depends on, on, on your architecture, right? And one of the problems with the, I think, the early SDP approach was it was very skewed towards on-prem architecture. Um, and I think, you know, one of the reasons people are maybe doing a zero trust is they want to get away from that. Um, so that would potentially be one. Now, there may be firms that are running hybrid that may want that solution, but I would think, you know, generally the advantages of having a cloud-based architecture um, are, are, are pretty solid, particularly if you can do like a, a mesh-based approach, which I think is really relevant these days. You know, as I mentioned earlier, users are everywhere, applications are everywhere, devices are everywhere. And I think having a gateway-based approach, which is essentially what a VPN is, or even a proxy, um, starts to get really cumbersome really fast um, where you're putting gateways everywhere. So that would be the one issue. Um, I think the risk in di discovering or delivering sensitive data through the cloud, um, you know, I, my view is I think that, so let me back up a bit. One of the biggest objections still in all the survey work we, we do at 451, the biggest objection to moving workloads to the cloud is still security. Um, that said, it is declining. And I think people are, and people are, people are getting more and more comfortable with moving things to the cloud. Um, it's not perfect, but I would certainly argue um, that, you know, for the most part, what the cloud providers do and what you can get through the cloud is actually more secure than what most enterprises can do on their own. Um, so um, I don't know if, any, if anyone else has anything to add to that, but that would be my view. Um, maybe, Garrett, I would just add one comment to that, which is when, when you move to the cloud, uh, you know, of course, as Banyan, we are biased, uh, we firmly believe you should move to the cloud that you are investing in. And most most companies, most enterprises we talk to today are into, uh, investing in Azure or AWS or IBM or one of those clouds. And each of these clouds, e even though you know they have different capabilities, they have more than enough capability to provide you secure access using a zero trust philosophy. And so that that's our bias is is when you move to the cloud, use your cloud. 
you know, don't necessarily go by somebody else, yet another cloud, essentially. Great point. Great. Well, I think for the sake of time, I think we'll um, close out the webinar. So that concludes the webinar for today. Thank you so much, Garrett, Tarun, and Sadiq. On behalf of Banyan and 451 Research, thank you so much for attending today and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.